everyone, and welcome to another episode of Lou Chat. Today, I'm joined by Strawberry Station. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Strawberry Station. I am a huge funk artist from the UK, currently living in Canada. So, yeah, just like out here vibing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, what made you make future funk music in the first place? It was kind of a thing where I was, uh, I mean, I always had a door. So I, I got FL Studio something stupid like nine or ten years ago. I got it like as a Christmas present because I was bugging my parents. But I always had it and I never really did anything with it uh, until I started hanging around with my friends in Leicester. And uh, they used to play like Vaporwave and stuff on the TV there. And then yeah. one day they played, um, it was Cherry Pepsi by St. Pepsi, like came on the TV. And I was pretty drunk, and I just like sat up in my sat up in the sofa, yeah. like, and it just like grabbed me instantly. And from then on, I was like obsessed with uh, obsessed with like uh, future funk and stuff. You know, I went home, listened to the whole of Hit Vibes, uh, listened to the stuff that was doing the rounds on artsy music. This was like about twenty seventeen, so I kind of missed the initial yeah. kind of like like wave of it but i was definitely there when it was like just starting to hot up and stuff mm. um, and yeah i i saw that people were making out i noticed there were some little tutorials like around and stuff uh and i thought yeah i'm gonna give this a go it was um it, there were a lot of missteps in the early days i didn't really know what i was doing because i didn't have any like production training or anything <laughs> but um Eventually, I started to get the hang of some of the absolute basic concepts. Um, Ed's tutorials were really handy. They're in like the sidebar on the subreddit, and he, um, the one he did on drum mixing, was a really useful kind of stopping off point for me because he um, he includes like a, there, there's a there's a project file for FL Studio in there that kind of shows you how stuff's set up, and being able to study that was a really good like first step. Mm. And then yeah, it all just kind of snowballed from there. So. Basically, I blame my friends from Leicester for getting me into it, really, and I've yeah, never yeah. looked back. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy how how much Future Funk and Vaporwave have gone from like an underground genre to having like playlists on Spotify with over mm. a hundred thousand followers. Yeah, it was nuts. Yeah. I looked at the uh, I, I looked at the uh, playlist again like today because yeah. uh, I got I got listed again. Hooray! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I got a new song out. Uh, okay. Two, literally like two days before the train to move so that was that was good timing for the release really um but yeah like uh, i've seen that playlist like grow and grow as well so it's at like what one hundred and five thousand now is it yeah it's, it's crazy it's crazy, it's, that it's crazy to think like the scene has that sort of like pulling power for a spotify pl- like to have any sort of spotify playlist and let alone one that yeah you're getting like a hundred thousand people listening to every month so it's really good for us as like artists and stuff, and uh, yeah, it's it's it seems like it's only going to keep growing as long as people keep making the music for it, you know. Yeah, they had they playlisted a lot of smaller artists as well, which was good. Like they put Chevron on there. He doesn't have mm-hmm. many like listeners, but they put you and I, I think, on that playlist, and it it, yeah. it, it has like over a hundred thousand streams now on Spotify. It's awesome, right. yeah. I, I, it's 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 hard to keep track, you know, especially when you're kind of like involved with like other artists and stuff. Just through like the amount of time that you've been doing it and the connections you make, it can sometimes be hard to keep track of like new artists that are starting up and coming through and stuff. I try to keep like my finger on the pulse, but something like this playlist is handy because you know, it introduces you to a couple of people that you might have like missed or like had slipped through the cracks like over mm. time and. Especially with the way that the kind of like um, scene's gone up in all like different directions and stuff, and um, it's 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 just a matter of how far it's grown, you know. That um, that yeah, you can have all this awesome stuff that you might have missed, and uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's nice to have the recognition as well that something like Spotify um, acknowledges the genre, and um, as you said, like it's coming from. A pretty like underground place like to start with mm-hmm. it was just an offshoot of vaporwave which itself is <laughs> a monolith all to itself really but it's like it was a 
it was never a commercial genre, so it's kind of like it's 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 weird, but it's a good weird to like to see it recognized on that sort of platform, you know? Yeah. I imagine the playlist will do bigger and bigger numbers as time goes on. I think the fact that again they get smaller eyes to spotlight, I think will really yeah. propel the genre. As For time real. goes on. I think there's there's always a danger if like uh, it's the same artists getting all the airplay and stuff. They ends up feeling like a bit of a closed shop. Yeah. So I think it, it's important to keep it fresh, you know, and like mm. ensure that um, yeah, there's fresh blood and different sounds and stuff. Especially considering how people have evolved over time. You know, a lot mm. of things that are, like classified as future funk nowadays don't really sound anything like that. The songs that were coming out, like even when I started off in 2017, you know, things have yeah. changed a lot, even in the past like four years or whatever. So, I remember reading a while back on social media that you were <laughs> having trouble making future funk music. Um, this was on Twitter, I think. Did you overcome that writer's block? Again? At the moment, yeah, I think I think I think I'm in a better place now. Um, I think uh, it, it's kind of weird because I kind of like saw that when I when I came to Canada, I'd be able to like you know I'd have all this spare time to myself and uh, I'd be able to like focus on like doing the music like more and more and more. But that just didn't really happen. I think I put it largely down to the pandemic and it like yeah. stacking a bit of like the energy to like make that kind of like upbeat dance music and stuff. Um, when I'm in the mood to do it, I can still make songs. But I would say you know you compare like. Before 2020, I was putting out like two albums a year at that point. It's kind of like slowed down to the, at this point. And, uh, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because you know, I'm taking more time to kind of be happy with something before I put it out now. Whereas yeah. uh, I look at some of the early works and I think, you know, there's, there's probably, it's not that I don't like my older albums or whatever. You know, I'm still happy to like play songs mm. in sets from like Strawberry Dreams or whatever. But, um, I guess, I guess it's just a natural progression when you when you've been doing it for a while to kind of like raise your standards a little bit, I guess, and mm. try and improve your production. And that takes more time, I guess, as you learn new elements and you yeah you put them on top. Um, and yeah, I think last year, especially towards the end of last year, I was finding it really tough to like make music that I was happy with. Um, it's kind of been the same this year, but uh, I've got a lot of projects on the go at the moment that are kind of keeping me occupied, which is good. I've got a lot of energy coming from like different areas now, and uh, mm. it's kind of like propelling me onwards to like make more stuff now. But um, yeah, I, I think bottom line is yes, I have uh, more or less overcome it now, but it's more acknowledging that I don't have to sit down and have something tangible to release like there and then on that night so yeah. i can I, I used to be far more driven in the sense that if i started something i'd have tunnel vision until i finished it whereas now i have a lot of like little projects that i'll maybe start and then just like dip into and go back to so i'd say my process has changed but i think it's had to change because i kind of like burnt myself out like working in the way that i did like up until 2020 mm. but yeah I'm, I'm good now. I'm in a good place. Good. Hell yeah. We'd love to hear it. Um, <laughs> what have you got on the horizon uh, like in the next six months, for example, until uh, the end of the year? And oh boy, is that... Yeah, but there, there, is, there is a lot of stuff, actually. So um, I would have said the uh, yesterday's jam mini disc, but uh, that literally sold out yesterday, so that's yeah. all gone. Congrats on that. Um, yeah, I've been busy working with my Patreon, uh, my patrons um, to like provide new content to them. Mm. So at the moment, we're in the middle of um, uh, preparing our first cassette club release. So I've got like a tape coming out for them called "Just Me and You." That's like a collection of B sides and kind of deep cuts that I've put out on the Patreon in the past couple of years. Yeah. And uh, that that's going to look beautiful. We got some new artwork from Heskets, and it's coming on these like ruby red cassettes. It looks like a really cool package. So I'm going to be picking those up like in the next couple of weeks. That's going to be going out there. Um, we've actually already planned the second release for that cassette club, um, which is going to be um, 
the very first album I ever put out at Strawberry Station. So I mentioned being a Future Front guy, but like the first thing I ever made at Strawberry Station was Vaporwave. Yeah. Um, and that first album, like the Ichigo Eki album, is, um, has never had a physical release, partly because it's pretty basic, but I still consider it, you know, part of the journey and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, the patrons were keen to have that on a physical release. So we're funding that. Probably, I'm probably going to put the order in for that, like the start of July, and get that out in September. Mm. Um, first tape shipping in July. Um, in terms of new music, um, obviously, Shrubby Shrubby Beat just launched. Um, mm. That's the one that got playlisted. Uh, I've got. Um, I'm working on like a sequel to Low Light, the kind of like more introspective album I made last year while I was bummed out from the pandemic. So yeah. That's that's shaping up really nice now. We've got like five or six tracks. I'm in the middle of like working on, um, or at least trying to like mix better because I have no vocal mixing skills whatsoever. <laughs> um, I've got a I've got a song with Fawn on that album, um, which again was supposed to come out last year. It was supposed to be this like big happy song about like how the pandemic's over, <laughs> and then the pandemic just kept on going. It's so uh, into yeah. Pretty much, like twenty twenty was all right. I was all ready to like release that, like in uh, in the summer. I expected a pandemic to go away, but obviously it didn't. So we're gonna try again. It's still relevant. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's still relevant. But yeah, so that's uh, that low light two album. I'm probably I'm considering giving it a different name, but I I will probably just call it low light two, and uh, should have that ready. Uh, at the, at the rate it's going, I'll probably have a full raft of tracks for that by July, maybe like the middle of July. Um, we've been doing a lot of that on my Twitch streams, mainly because working with samples on a Twitch stream is a bad idea. So I've been trying to do like electronic music on Twitch. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, um, and I've already spoken to a label about releasing that one and they seem keen. So um, we'll have tapes for that. Um, there is also another like project that I'm kind of like keeping a lid on at the moment, but um, I'm working with a few guys on like some collabs for it, and that, uh, which, if all goes to plan, I believe will probably launch at the end of the year. So I'm talking uh, November, December time for a new release, and that's a, that that specific release is gonna probably I'm just gonna go all in, go the whole hog, do the yeah. cassettes, vinyl. Mini disc. I'll release it on a wax cylinder if you pay me enough. <laughs> release it on a fucking uh, floppy disk or VHS disc, tape. Uh, yeah. I always say, what what would you say the most obscure musical format is? I don't even know, honestly. Like, um, I'd say mini disc. Mini disc is it? Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, my 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 life's ambition is to release a song on music musical road. What is that? A musical road. It's closing the name, so they build like oh, bridges is it... into oh, is it bridges the, into the tarmac, it? and then when you drive over it at the correct speed, so yeah. you like put cruise control on your car or whatever, and just drive it thirty miles an hour. And uh, if you drive on it just right, it will play a song as you drive along it. There's like one in Japan that plays like "Ode to Joy" or something stupid. They yeah. tried to build one in uh, California, but they got it wrong, and it's just completely warped. It doesn't sound like anything. God. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the my dream format is Strawberry Station on Musical Road. <laughs> yeah, that's sick. Imagine if yeah. you could get that done. That's like but that's a that's a, that... that is the ultimate music format. Yeah. I think that that's pretty much it for this year. So I'll obviously be doing a bunch of live sets as well. I'm doing yeah. um doing the worldwide dot web. Uh, I'm on the Vapor STLs section of that, so that's going to be huge. So that's mm. got Vapor STL are involved, my Plet Flamingo are involved, and a bunch of other labels. It's just going to go on for like I think Utopia District's doing their bit as well. So it's like two days of non-stop music, I think, and it's just going to go across time zones and should be big. I'm looking forward to that one. We yeah, got yeah. the got the set ready to go. Um, no, nice. yeah. Stacked. Other than that, yeah. I've, I mean, there, there are other projects on the go as well. That's uh, uh, I, I I owe too many people too many songs at this point. But that's, uh, <laughs> at the moment, it's technically my full time job, so I'm you know I, I've got no excuse apart from currently being hungover. So, <laughs> oh yeah. 
Um, so you spoke about streaming on Twitch. Um, mm-hmm. So you stream mainly production and video games on your Twitch channel. So yeah. what do you like about live streaming? Oh, I, I really enjoy the little kind of like community aspect. I mean, um, ever since like... Um, Ever since kind of like the fan base started to grow, I think um, the, the the turning point was like making my own Discord and starting to get a little circle of people like around that like vibed with what I did and that kind of thing. And that one thing led to another that caused the the Patreon to happen, and the Twitch ended up being kind of an offshoot of that. It was originally going to be like an exclusive space just for like patrons to come and chill and watch me like make music or whatever. Mm. But I'm I, I'm I just kind of like got to really enjoy the kind of like random nature of it i guess like just yeah. like picking a controller playing whatever came to mind on that particular day we play loads of like retro games so i've been playing a lot of sega master system um we started playing sonic 2 recently as well and it's just stressing yeah. me out <laughs> I, I i never because i had the master system version i'm not so down on the genesis versions like the mega drive ones and, yeah. <laughs> yeah people just watch me fail and swear i even made myself a little vtuber model like for gaming days as well yeah. it's uh, really basic and it's got like an absolute like thousand yard stare but <laughs> yeah, I've seen uh, it. Yeah, i'm so pretty proud well. of it it's it's not bad actually, like yeah. for a first stab at one of those things, because I drew it all myself and rigged it. I need to do some of the facial expressions and fix them up because it like like I said, it just has that like kind of like dead eyed stare, like when you look away from the camera. Yeah. I could at least make it smile a bit, but <laughs> yeah, I but yeah, I, I like Twitch I like Twitch and like all the little communities and stuff. It's crazy, like you know, I watch you know, some people that I watch like on Twitch, like uh, actual like uh like mutuals of mine now and like we we just vibe and like we'll just raid each other's streams and whatever and uh yeah it's always fun to like have those little hype moments where you just have like 40 people just randomly join your stream from somebody else's place and it's like hey there uh, um i guess i'm playing mario tonight so, <laughs> uh, and then of course you've got all the you know when you have the events like uh like uh, I think the first real big one where I like, realized like how big these things could be was probably Wave Pool last year mm. when uh, you know we had um, that massive kind of like fundraising drive uh, yeah, about yeah, lives yeah. matter and bail funds and stuff, uh, and uh, it was crazy. And then seeing like the amount of people that were like jumping in and stuff. I mean, I was playing to like two hundred and fifty people, and then like by the end when I think uh, we had St Pepsi on, it was like. Their numbers were insane, They're like drawing like four figures, you know, like a thousand people watching yeah, some most, va- some yeah. vapor wave, you know. When so, Molly Shot played, I think we had the most viewers. Don't yeah, know that, that was crazy. Yeah, I was at work while that one was going, on, unfortunately. I'm yeah. a, not not my problem anymore, but it's like yeah. I, I watched it back and it was like, yeah, you could see the hype levels. Yeah, sort of so many people. Really were, I remember watching that yeah. set line, mm. the one you did. Uh, the, the Knox joke. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's not what I'm, I've moved on but... from that now, but I'm proud to still be a meme in the community for that. <laughs> what do you think about uh, his take on uh, future funk music? Uh, it's bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's so uh, it, the scene has matured so much. For starters, it is very much a real scene because the scene is just built around a community. It's like saying vaporwave isn't a real genre. Yeah. And it obviously is, you know, it's hard to it's hard to define, but it's ultimately a musical genre is determined by the people around it that classify it as such. It's like saying uh it's like saying, I don't know, like Chicago House isn't a genre because it's just people from Chicago playing house music. But that wasn't true. They had their own little nuances and their own little cultural kind of like community elements that kind of built the music around them, you know. Mm. So, um, and that that that's the way that genres have um, grown and uh, now become created has definitely changed. You look at something like, well, even going back to like the rise of like dubstep and stuff, that was one of the first true like online music genres. But then mm. you go forward in time to stuff now, like uh, like I guess hyper pop is another great example at present, where these scenes are not necessarily growing, especially in a pandemic. It's impossible to like just meet people down the club and like make like-minded like musical discoveries together which is how these things happened like back in the past but 
Uh, hopefully that will change now that uh, things are slowly improving and we can like, get back to doing live shows and stuff. Yeah. Um, touch wood, because I should be fully vaccinated by September, but touch wood, I might actually be uh, playing a little something in October when I get back. But we will see. We will see. That's Have you there. had your first jab yet? I have indeed. I am on. I am officially on, on the Pfizer. Yeah, so gang. I'm <laughs> Pfizer gang. Yeah, I had mine. <laughs> yeah. three days ago, I think, and it made me feel awful. I actually had to take the day off work. But... It makes it does make you pretty sleepy, doesn't it? Like second, yeah. like day after, and your arms kind of like achy. But I feel fine. It's good. Now. It's it's a it's a good tired because at least you know it's doing something. Yeah. <laughs> <Just> like... <laughs> Yeah, I heard the second one's worse, so like I'm, I'm I'm not planning anything like the week after September 11th. So I'm just going to be like in bed at making vaporwave. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds good. Yeah. I'll probably have to yeah. work, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. For real. <laughs> you stream video games on your Twitch. What mm-hmm. would you say are some of your favorite video games of all time? Oh, oh, tough one. That one. Um. It's probably just the the games that like defined me um, growing up in my childhood. Um, so yeah. um, one of the games that we always played, and I'm actually pretty hyped. There's actually a HD remake coming next month. I think it's coming out. It's Alex Kidd in Miracle World on Sega Master System. Yeah, uh, which is a, a game is as hard as nails, and we finally finished it live on stream mm-hmm. like last month. After 25 years, because like we got the Sega Master System when my stepdad moved into the house, so I would have been three years old. Would have been 1995, yeah. <laughs> 1996 actually. And uh, I, you know, it was one of the first video games I can actually remember playing like properly. You know, I have very vague memories of like my grandparents having the Commodore 64, but I never really played that. But oh, um, like yeah, 25 so years, already. 25 years. It's like the first but... thing I remember playing is the PlayStation One. Well, it wasn't long until we got it. We were basically we, we we just got hand me down. Like my brother would go around his friends to play SNES. Like this was this was very much the sixteen bit era when I got into gaming. Like, yeah. But we had an eight bit console because we were the poor kids. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, in, in reality, it was just because me and my brother were probably a little too young to like actually have parents like burn like two hundred pounds as it was then on like a yeah that's fair. on like a SNES or whatever. But um, you know, when the PS One came out, my brother was like seven, eight years old at the time. So yeah, we went all in. I can still remember going to game in Loughborough and getting it, and we got like the we got the Hercules uh, Disney action game, which was sick. Uh, International Superstar Soccer Pro, which is still my favourite football oh, yeah. game of all time. <laughs> and uh, oh, there was another one as well. Oh, Buster Move as well. We had Buster oh, Move Buster Two. Move. Like, yeah, yeah man. so we got yeah we had a really cool like collection on our ps1 like growing up but uh yeah i e- even even when the ps1 was around i used to always bug my stepdad to like hook up the uh hook up the master system so i could play like uh sonic and alex kid on the big old wood wood panel tv like in their yeah. bedroom they had this really old thing from the seventies. It had like literally had four channels on it, but <laughs> we still managed. To, we still managed to like get the game console hooked up on it, which was cool. Uh, the Pokemon's massive for me as well. Gen One, Gen Two. I think my I played. I've played more Red and Blue than probably any other um, any other kind of like era. But I think my favorite games are probably probably Gold and Silver. That second generation, just like. It was just a perfect time in life, you know, when you're like a kid and literally nothing matters except like sneaking off at lunch to like go and like trade Pokemon with your link cables behind the mobiles or yeah. whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I still get very like nostalgic, sometimes even teary nostalgic when I kind of like hear the the Pokemon Johto theme tune from morning TV. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, it just like takes me right back, man. But yeah, a lot of retro games. Um, more recently, I guess I play a lot of Minecraft. Um, I don't really play AAA games, but that's more because I don't really have a sis. I play I play Switch really, so yeah, right. Animal Crossing, uh, bit, a little bit of Smash Bros. Um, but yeah, I mostly just play like quirky shit and retro games nowadays. It's interesting that uh, you play a lot of retro games because I think um, it's not like not many people play retro games anymore, but it's. Uh... I think as people have moved on, they want to play more graphically better-looking video games. Mm. Obviously, it's great that people still appreciate like the eight-bit and sixteen-bit 
video games. You know? Yeah, for real, for real. And the thing is, a lot of them like still, you know, I, I think, I think even when you know you're a PS one era and uh, uh, you know a lot, of, a lot of the games like they were colourful and stuff. But I don't know, there's just something about kind of like the, the, especially the Master System had like an amazing graphics chip for the time, and like the colours yeah. were really vivid. I remember getting a NES for the first time and uh, playing that like on the same TV and thinking everything just looked kind of washed out. I never appreciated it as a kid, yeah. but like the graphics on something like, uh, like like on on the 8 bit sonic or um again alex kid game uh, there's this little shoot 'em up called fantasy zone as well uh which is really good fun and it's like not your typical like shoot 'em up kind of like you're a spaceship but it's like stu- super cutesy and stuff and yeah it's just as a console you know it's just so bright all these primary colors you know very um really hooked me you know like that kind of like aesthetic that kind of like 8 bit and and the chip tune as well. I, I, I've always loved chip tune, probably because yeah. I still hold those like eight bit, sixteen bit consoles dear to my heart. You know, like when we're playing, whenever we play, um, whenever we play like Sonic Two on uh, <laughs> on the stream, I just spend most of my time just like just like commenting on how sweet the music is, rather than actually playing the game. <laughs> yeah, probably explain why I'm so bad at it. Right? Well, didn't Michael Jackson do the soundtrack for Sonic Three? I believe so, yeah. But he never he, he wasn't credited for it because I think he like uh, wasn't happy with how they were finished and they had like a deadline to meet or something like that. Yeah. But he was a big fan of the Sonic games. I know. I think it was actually the games on Sonic Two that convinced him to do it on Sonic Three. Mm. And the soundtrack on Sonic Two does absolutely slap. There's so many good songs on it. I, I need to listen to it. I think I have played Sonic 2, but I don't remember the soundtrack. Yeah. I'll have to delve and have, mm. a, have a gander. It's um, weird. I think the, um, the the sound chip for like the Genesis, the, the Mega Drive, is um, it's probably it's it's the one where like if you if if you do it right, you do it really right. You know, like the <laughs> the sounds it can produce are so cool. Mm. It has it's like the most quintessentially nineties sounding game console for me. Yeah, but if you do it wrong, it can sound absolutely horrible. <laughs> the, uh, the 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 one that I remember, my, my dad used to like work for like a charity, and he used to like get like stuff that was getting thrown out of the charity shops so they couldn't sell it. Mm. And he found um he found a Motley Crue pinball game, wow. a Motley Crue ball for for, nice for Mega Drive video games. I took it home, and it was the worst sounding video game I, in my I'd ever heard in my life. You know, they were trying to like digitize on the 60 on the genesis sound chip like motley crew so like dr feel good and yeah <laughs> like kickstart my heart and all that shit uh, it just sounded so bad it was unbelievable there's definitely an art to it but it's like everything else you know it's like if yeah. you learn to master something you can make some sweet sounds so what made you move out to canada hmm. it was um I, I was a bit bored with my job um yeah, and it was one of those things where I'm I'm not getting any younger. I, I I wanted to take the opportunity while I could. I mean, I'm 28 now, so this visa that I'm on, I could only have applied for it until I was 30, um, mm. and then um, yeah, it's only for like young people and like graduates and stuff. Um, opportunity to see a different. Well, I wouldn't say it's a crazily different culture, but it is still you know the, the culture here is still different to in the UK. You know, it's like. Um, uh, a chance to travel. I've always liked like going abroad and like seeing new places. Yeah. Um, I think. Um, yeah, I think a lot of like the self confidence that I gained from like starting to make the music and um, making those connections and stuff. You know, like I have friends out here now. You know, like I'm friends with like Indie Advent, uh, Wayne, Panic Pop. Um, supposed to be meeting the the richest man, man in Vaporwave soon as well, Mister Porter. Oh, it's not. He lives not far from Toronto, apparently. Yeah. He's finally moved from his uh, billion-dollar palace in Hong Kong. Um, wow. <laughs> is he actually rich, or is it like... I don't know. Didn't he go to Electronicon in a, in a full light suit and tie, I heard? Wow, I don't know. If he did, then that's a power move, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Find out. I need, to, I need to find out the mysteries of Porter Vong and his... Yeah. The ways of success, you know, that's... Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I you know, um, being part of this scene, like, really gave me, like, the self-confidence to take that kind of, like, crazy plunge. 
and uh, you know take a chance on moving out here. It hasn't worked out exactly as I hoped it would, but then I don't think it has for literally anybody on Earth in the past year and a half. So uh, yeah, yeah, I kind of like I, I, I kind of suck it up. I've got I've got the summer ahead of me now, and now things are like vaguely starting to reopen. I've started like booking around to kind of like um, do a little bit of traveling within the country while I can. Uh, so I'm going to get out to like BC and meet my friend, see like the Rockies and Vancouver and that. I booked a train ticket that go back. Um, me and India are going to take a road trip out east as well when the chance arises. So see like Quebec and Nova Scotia. Yeah, part of the reason I came as well, based on the scene, was um, was obviously to do live shows and like make connections within the scene. Yeah. Um, Again, didn't work exactly as hopes, but you know, I know so I know some cool people like from, like um, so like obviously I know Indian stuff, so I know like the guys from Utopia District, uh, Tiger Blood Tapes now, um, yeah, I need to I need to talk with uh, Panic actually about like the I hope I'm hoping to meet like Six Stroke before I leave as well. I know yeah, he, yeah. he's based in the GTA, so um, you know, you see, there's like there's all these cool people like Toronto is a real like. Hub of like vaporwave if you stretch below the surface. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of people that are kind of into the scene. It's just a shame, obviously, we couldn't bring that into like a live sphere. But yeah, that was it really. That was the main reason I came out here it was um, mm. to take take a plunge, take a chance, and uh, see what I could do with myself. And uh, yeah, yeah, it hasn't it hasn't been ideal because of the pandemic. It's been kind of a bummer at times, like a real bummer. But I'm feeling good at the moment and. Uh, yeah, I have no regrets coming here at all. Wasn't a central two meant to be in Toronto? It was indeed, yes. Yeah. So I am, um, uh, yeah. So I, I was put on the essential roster. Um, it was going to happen last April, and I actually moved to Toronto. Like, um, I spent the first couple of months in London, Ontario, which is a uh, city like out west of here. It's quite. It's a funny place because like all the places in town are like named after places in the actual London. So there's like a there's an Oxford Street and there's like mm. a Kensington Bridge or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> there's a Thames River running through it, <laughs> yeah. um, which is like a shit version of everything in the re- like real London, quote unquote. Yeah, um, yeah, that was good. I, I quite enjoyed my time there, you know, and that was in the dead of Canadian winter. But um, the op- I was struggling to find a job, so I bit the bullet and moved to Toronto. Like literally just as the pandemic was kicking off but part of the logic of that was like having a base in the city for essential mm. which obviously never happened but um yeah that was a uh, obviously a bit of a bummer but yeah it is what it is you know and i'm glad i was here instead of like out in london during the pandemic yeah well, this is, there's a little more to do you know it's a bigger place yeah in the uk it was a uh, not much well Besides it being terrible, not much really happened, not going to lie. Mm. Yeah, but, you know, although cases are going up again here, but everyone's getting vaccinated, so hopefully it means yeah, that. As, I mean, I've seen, I've seen like, the uh, uh, the trends and stuff in the UK. It's been it's been good, though, considering, like, the, the mess it was in, like, back in January. Yeah, Whereas here, here they were like sitting on their hands getting people vaccinated and the result was we had like a big third wave over like March and April which is why I'm still sat here in lockdown while the UK is reopening. Yeah, we're still in lockdown until the 14th of June at least. Um, they, we, had a, we had a legal stay at home order until uh, the start of this week. Hmm. So like it was illegal to leave your house apart from for essential purposes and that's been in place for like two months. So yeah, it's been uh, <laughs> it's been pretty wild, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, things are getting better. I mean, we went out yesterday, had a good day. So uh, met Chris from Tiger Blood yesterday, which was cool. So another another vapor face. <laughs> yeah. Lastly, would you say that? So you're from Leicester. Mm-hmm. Would you say that Leicester City are the best football team in the Premier League? Well, we're technically the fifth best because we finished fifth. I'm going to be. Uh, Diplomatic there, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to say Leicester City are the best team in the world. <laughs> they're, uh, they're, they're my club, and I've been following them since the season that we got relegated to League One, so the third division. That was yeah. uh, 
So I can't be accused of being a glory hunter or anything because I literally started watching in our worst ever season. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. How did so, you feel when they first won the Premier League? That's crazy. I have like, uh, you know, I have so many memories from that year and stuff. And, you know, we were still kind of like reeling from the fact that we'd only just avoided relegation the year before, you know, I was uh, yeah. I was there front row for like most of the great escape the year before. So it was... Uh, it was crazy to like go from that to suddenly like oh damn I guess we're the best team in the country now and we're uh, <laughs> like mad, a whole bunch it? of people in Leicester that habitually put ten pounds on us to win the league every year. Some of them actually made like fifty thousand pounds off of their little bets. Crazy, which is crazy. I know. Uh, yeah. yeah, we're we're the uh, we're the team that officially ended all those stupid odds in at betting shops because so many people were like some people genuinely became millionaires off the back of that, which is insane. Yeah, yeah, I support what West Ham. Uh, West Ham, you guys were unlucky this year. I thought I thought you I thought you and us were both going to break like into the Champions League spots. So. Yeah, <laughs> it, it wasn't it to is. be, but at least we won the we at least won won the FA Cup. I think My it's dad's one of the been best my way. Placings for West Ham, not not ever, but like for a long they, time. They did really well. I, a lot of people were expecting them to really struggle this year. Like they were yeah. supposedly going to be down in like a relegation battle. I didn't expect that much to happen for West Ham because I mean, what exactly have West Ham done in the past like five years yeah. apart from like flirt with relegation? But no, yeah. but fair play. Well. Like, so sort of love the guys there. Me. So agent Jesse Lingard, like, just suddenly Jesse decided, Lingard. you know, how to play football again. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he got called up to play for England. No, he didn't. I don't know why. They brought four left backs, one of whom now got injured. But yeah. He gets, he's got to make a choice, like, who does he bring? Like, I think it's it's, it's going to be either Lingard or James Ward-Prowse, by the sounds of it. Both yeah. of which are good players, and I don't know why they didn't make the squad. But I guess they can only take so many people. How do you think England yeah. are doing the Euros? Uh... Everybody here keep, uh, that I've spoken to about it, I've got like a few friends that I play like football with here, and they all seem to think England are a dark horse for the like the whole tournament. Yeah, but I I don't know. I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I've seen enough miracles with Leicester City, so who who knows? <laughs> who knows? Yeah, it was crazy to see him get to the semis in 2018. That I remember, was such a good I remember being in a pub in London. Yeah, we. I, I, it's it's one of those things. Like nothing beats a World Cup summer when you actually go on a bit of a run. Because like I don't really remember. Uh, well, obviously I don't remember 1990. I wasn't born, but it's like uh, that kind of like World Cup fever kind of thing. Most mm-hmm. of my life following football, England have always been a bit shit in tournaments. You know, so it was like yeah. surreal. <laughs> the the simple fact we won a penalty shootout, I'm still reeling from. I can't quite believe that happened. It was always a curse, wasn't it? Yeah, that we never won. Like... <laughs> so yeah, that 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 was cool. I just really enjoyed like being down the pub and stuff, and getting sprayed with what I hope was beer like, <laughs> every time England scored. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a grand old time. Yeah, twenty eighteen was a good year. It's like, I miss it. Seems like such a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. Um, right. Um, so. Do you have anything to plug or anything to say before I finish? The uh, yeah, I guess I might as well. Like, um, shout out to shout out to some of my friends in the scenes. Shout out to guys like Ma, Mr. Kitsune, Ducat, uh, Groovy Kaiju. I could just, I could be racking off like people for the next five minutes. All of yeah. my good friends. <laughs> yeah. I get a oh, shout out to those. Uh, I do have a Patreon if anybody's interested. Uh, we're still going to have a few copies of those tapes like mm-hmm. lying around. So anybody that signs up by the end of June, I'll give you one. Uh, yeah, I've, you know, I've got a Bandcamp. I've got a Spotify. Just search for Strawberry Station. You'll find me. Uh, otherwise, yeah, shout out to you for letting me come on the uh, come you. on the podcast. Um, thank you to everybody that supported me so far. Uh, sorry, Mum, you're going to have to... Uh, make the bed because I'm coming home in October <laughs> so no more using my room as like a laundrette wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah you know uh, shout out to all my friends and family back home because I'll come and see you uh, sooner rather than later four months to go that's not mm. far away wow mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I'll link your, your Patreon and bank of everything in the description so people can just... For real, that'll be awesome, there. man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah. Um, thank you for joining me, Strawberry Station. Yeah, peace. Thank you again for letting me come on. It's all good. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you got this far, I don't know how long your attention spans are, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> There's all that football talk put them yeah, off. Yeah, put them off. They're not I'm listening like, to this bit. No, yeah. I don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for the music. Um... <laughs> But yeah, I'll see you guys all next time. Peace out.